Overweight puppies are five times more likely to develop hip dysplasia. What's the origin of this remarkable statistic and can we trust it? Well, it comes from a University of Pennsylvania research team and yes, we can trust it. The researchers meticulously controlled multiple factors that could influence skeletal development, ensuring that the only variable was overfeeding. They followed 24 pairs of eight-week-old Labrador littermates with shared genetic backgrounds for life. Matched by initial weight and gender, the puppies ate the same brand of food and they had the same exercise program. The only difference was how much food they ate. Puppies in group one were allowed to eat as much as they wanted, while group two puppies ate 25% less. Adult dogs' food intake was adjusted so dogs in group one were overweight but not obese, while dogs in group two were lean. And this is how they remained throughout life. Overweight dogs in one group and lean dogs in the other. Now this research used an experimental study design. Diligent control of multiple variables gives us the confidence to conclude that overfeeding causes expression of the genes which code for hip dysplasia. And that overfeeding causes an increased risk of osteoarthritis. There are no experimental studies comparing neutering to joint disease. All available research used data extracted from prior medical records. This is called observational research. Now, observational studies can show that X is related to Y, but they cannot prove that X causes Y. Proving a cause and effect relationship requires a study design which satisfies three conditions. Condition one. There must be a clear and consistent association between X, the proposed cause, and Y, the supposed effect. This clear and consistent association is called a statistical relationship or correlation. Condition two, for X to cause Y, X must come before Y. And finally, condition three, as I just said, Y mustn't be influenced by uncontrolled factors other than X. These so-called confounding variables include diet, lifestyle, and most importantly, owner attitudes. Dogs are not randomly selected for neutering. It's a choice. As such, our attitude to prophylactic surgery strongly influences the outcome of neutering studies. So let's start with condition one. Is the association between neutering and joint disease clear and consistent? In 1999, Raven, a six-year-old chimpanzee, became the USA's 22nd most successful money manager. She outperformed over 6,000 professional Wall Street brokers, choosing her stocks by throwing darts at a list of 133 internet companies. If you've ever heard the expression about as accurate as a dart throwing chimpanzee, you have Raven to thank. She teaches us that if you throw enough darts, some of them are bound to hit their target. Now I'm going to ask a specific question. Are dogs neutered before one year significantly more likely to develop joint disease or cancer compared with dogs who aren't neutered before one year? I'll use data source from this widely cited study and I'll set the bar low for condition one, the requirement for a clear and consistent relationship. We're looking for better consistency than a dart throwing chimpanzee. We'll start with an example, male German shepherd dogs. We'll compare shepherds neutered before one year to shepherds who weren't neutered before one year using a Fisher's exact statistical test. A statistical correlation requires a test result with a p-value of less than 0.05. That's our bullseye. Any result which falls outside the 0.05 threshold signifies no correlation, and there are no prizes for coming close. In other words, statistical correlations require a direct hit. For male shepherds, there were no correlations between neutering under one year and hip dysplasia, elbow dysplasia or cancer, but there was a strong correlation with ACL injuries later in life. And what happens when we run Fisher's exact test for all 35 breeds? 
Current public perception is of a clear and consistent relationship, especially for large breed dogs. If this were true, most darts should hit the bullseye and those that don't should be from small breed dogs. Now here are the actual results. There were only 14 statistically significant relationships with one indicating an apparent cancer reducing effect of early neutering on male Labradors. Here are the actual statistical wagon wheels for males and females, which show correlations for only one in 20 comparisons. In other words, about as consistent as a dart throwing chimpanzee. Now I've already discussed condition two, that the proposed cause must precede the supposed effect and show that neutering after skeletal maturity can't cause hip dysplasia or elbow dysplasia because they develop before skeletal maturity. So let's move on to condition three, confounding variables. Studying entire populations is either difficult or impossible because entire populations are often huge. For example, if we wanted to learn the average weight of domestic dogs, we couldn't weigh 461 million dogs. Instead, we'd select a sample group. If we make a mistake selecting our sample group, it can easily invalidate our study. For instance, if we only recruited Great Danes, our average weight would be far too high. And if we only recruited toy poodles, it would be far too low. We need to know if the University of California's joint disease data accurately reflects the dog population. To do this, we can compare it to a public registry like the Orthopaedic Foundation for Animals. The OFA publishes data on X-ray diagnoses of hip and elbow dysplasia. In 2020, bulldogs ranked third for hip dysplasia with an incidence of 70%. So the University of California's data should also show hip dysplasia in around 70% of bulldogs with a slight margin of error. They didn't. In fact, they weren't even close, reporting hip dysplasia in only 1% of bulldogs. How about elbow dysplasia, another common condition in bulldogs? In 2020, the OFA reported it in 38% of bulldogs, but the University of California reported an incidence of 0.2%. If you're thinking I've cherry picked an outlier, think again. This graph shows a consistent and dramatic mismatch between the University of California's data shown in white and the OFA registry data shown in blue for hip dysplasia and red for elbow dysplasia. So are Californian dogs somehow special? Are they far less prone to joint diseases compared to dogs in other parts of the United States? Or is there another explanation? There's another explanation, which brings us to the question of how we diagnose joint disease, or just as importantly, how we prove a dog doesn't have joint disease. Remarkably, in all five of the University of California studies, dogs whose hips or elbows weren't x-rayed were classified as normal. This isn't a minor study limitation, it's a critical flaw, and I'll explain why. Most pet owners who decide against neutering don't have a problem with the operation itself. Their problem is choosing an operation which might not be necessary. If their dog had a serious problem like pyometra or a malignant testicular tumour, they'd have no problem choosing therapeutic neutering. And if that same dog had a life-threatening condition like gastric dilatation and volvulus, there's a good chance they'd accept referral to the local specialist centre, somewhere like the University of California's veterinary teaching hospital. If this dog had joint disease, we'd never know because there was no reason to take joint x-rays. She'd be classified as normal, even if she wasn't. A referral for a discretionary investigation requires an entirely different mindset. Limping or stiffness are not life-threatening. We have no way of knowing if an owner who says yes to prophylactic neutering is more likely to say yes to joint x-rays. It's an unknown quantity with the potential to significantly influence the outcome of neutering research. Now, regardless of our personal perspective, we shouldn't ignore the critical fact that the University of California studies, which are widely miscited as proof that neutering causes joint disease, do not compare dogs with joint disease to normal dogs. They're compared to dogs with no diagnosis. Any discussion about risk analysis must include a discussion about absolute and relative risk. 
In my opening statement, I said that overweight puppies are five times more likely to develop hip dysplasia. This is a relative risk statistic. The absolute difference between lean and overweight puppies was this. 15 out of 22 overweight puppies developed hip dysplasia compared to 3 out of 21 lean puppies. That's a 54% absolute difference, which is substantial, but it doesn't grab our attention like a five-fold relative difference. It's easy to influence people by changing the format of data. Politicians and researchers do it all the time. For example, let's pretend we live in a world where only one in a hundred entire bulldogs have hip dysplasia. If two in a hundred neutered bulldogs have hip dysplasia, that's an absolute increase of 1%. But relative risk has doubled. So when we read studies which express their results as odds or hazard ratios, the first thing we must do is check the base rate. If we don't, we'll often get a very distorted view of statistical relationships. To be clear, I'm not saying there's no relationship between neutering and joint disease, but I am saying that we must put this relationship in perspective. There's clear and consistent evidence that excess body fat causes joint disease, while there's a weaker and less consistent relationship between neutering and joint disease. Even so, we've tried and convicted neutering based on circumstantial evidence, but turned a blind eye to overfeeding despite overwhelming evidence of its guilt.